Wright, who is my second Pulitzer Conference I have to thank Dr. Leslie Cohn. Can you speak up just a tiny bit? Can't hear? I'm sorry. Um, this is my second Gebser conference, and the more I read Gebser, the more I really fall in love with Gebser and his ideas. It is so rich and so relevant to our times. I wanted to thank Dr. Leslie Coombs because he was the first one to actually introduce me to Gebser in a course in my PhD program called Introduction to Consciousness. That started my curiosity about Gebser and then I uh, got involved with the Gebser Society last year as a presenter, and this year I'm back again. And I'm still reading Gebser, and I'm still deepening into Gebser. So, what I wanted to do today was present my ideas, my work in progress, and using some of uh, Gebser's uh, ideas to illuminate uh, my work from his perspective. So the title is Eco Philosophy and the Feminine Divine Creating the Climate for a, a, a Perspective Consciousness. The nature of evolutionary consciousness that is urgently pressing toward us cannot be expressed in rational or categorical systems. And so long as it remains inexpressible, it cannot effectively enter into our awareness. We are compelled, therefore, to find a new form of statement. Gebser's words are prescient now as they were half a century ago. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Not really. <laughs> a little louder. Okay. I'll go up the back wall. Okay. I'll try to really protect my voice. So Gebser's words are prescient now as they were half a century ago. The social and the ecological crises of the 21st century represent a failure of the techno-industrial way of living and knowing. Humanity does not share a sacred story of creation, but yet our global techno-industry has already inextricably linked our biological destinies. It seems the human has developed technical hardware or exosomatic organs to stabilize a certain individuation, an individuation that privileges technology over nature and human beingness. So Gebser said what was, I love what Gebser said when he said, that what was necessary today to turn the tide of our situation <coughs> are not new philosophies like the phenomenological, the ontological, or existential, but etiologies. Every etiology is a verition and as such is valid only when it allows origin to become transparent in the present. I feel that the body as a biologically based self-eco-organizing system is such an etiology. Gebser said that etiologies must replace philosophy just as philosophy once replaced the myths. Etiologies are not a mere ontology, but they are a being in truth. They are a verition or a truth of existence, and they sustain the verity of the whole. Etiologies supersede the dualistic question of being or non-being. They are nothing more than existence.
<laughs> so what I'm proposing is that the body as a self-ego organizing system is such an etiology. The body as a biologically based self-ego organizing system this view sees the body as a system that does not organize itself independently of its environment. The environment is in the system, which is in the environment. This is like Edgar Morin's holographic principle. It's where you have system and environment, co-relationality and embeddedness. eco-organizing system is a biological individuation, an ontology that emerged out of hundreds of thousands of years of interaction and embeddedness with the ecological system. The full intimacy of this connection is only now being revealed as scientific findings in developmental biology and genetics provide new insights into the importance of environmental interaction for the development of organisms. These insights are really reshaping our understanding of how organism-environment interaction contributes to not only consistency, but also to variation in the development of organisms. self-eco-organizing system is a system of gesture, motility, and morphogenesis. And what's important about this is that the it exudes a mode of articulation that I feel the emerging mutation can enter into our awareness. Gebser said the new mutation can enter awareness only on the one condition that we work out ourselves the mode of articulation that will give it requisite clarity. So going back to this one. So the, the morphogenesis, the degree of plasticity and malleability in the human form is a mode of articulation. If you look at uh, what I said earlier about our technical individuation, it's almost like we have been colonized by our technology. So it's important to recover some of the aspects of our human being and beingness that are, have to do with the body as a living, breathing process. A living, breathing cosmology that can be penetrated by the emerging new order and the emerging new consciousness. It's like it has to sort of come into some kind of mode of articulation that can be integrated or enfolded in to our biological individuation. The body as a self-eco-organizing system situates us in origin, and it situates us in development. It is the fundamental ground of harmonization, the materia prima of life that provides the emerging mutation with an associated way to come into our consciousness and to crystallize. In this morphogenesis, subject and cosmos exist in each other unfolding and refolding, we exfoliate the inherited culture and we enfold anew. As stated by J. Beard Collicutt, ecology has made it plain to us the fact that we are enfolded, involved, 
and engaged within the living terrestrial environment. Therefore, ecology profoundly alters our understanding of ourselves and human nature collectively. It is almost impossible to understand the human outside of its embeddedness with nature, if you are looking at biological individuation. This kind of embeddedness is a co-relationality that cannot be designed from scratch. As I said, it's, it's a result of hundreds of thousands of years of interaction between the biological system and the ecological system. So this body life, this biological individuation, has evolutionary significance that cannot be redesigned, not only because of of its individuation, but also because of the variation of life forms and the life strategies that it also holds. The body can bridge us into the universe of living systems in order to create new order and new consciousness. In this way, you could sort of say that the body embedded in nature is autopoetic, autopoesis meaning self and creation. In this process, the organism and the environment are one unity and through their interactions and transformations regenerate. The body as a self-eco-organizing system can open up the climate for the power and, and intensity of consciousness that is pressing towards manifestation. Through sub, such participation, one could dis, discover a source of wholeness ordering one's existence and expression that knows no human, theoretical, or spatial differentiation. And as Gebser says, only a new strength of spirit, kindled from a primordial divine source, can create a new wellspring of life in the lifeless multitude, which will surely engender a new life purity, freshness, and strength in physical nature. The half-born must come to full life. So I guess you could say Gebser's view of evolution like Sri Aurobindo, uh, the notion was that the ultimate potentials of human consciousness are unfolded in the origin. Make it possible for us to conceive of reorganizing new developmental lines by tuning into our human origins. So how do we concretize this potential and create the climate and the mode of articulation? for the new order and for a new consciousness? How can we actually embody what it is that's trying to move through us? So I prepared a little clip of my students and I doing uh, movement where we are sort of uh, embodying the creative dynamics, formative dynamics, both developmental and universal. I would like to show it to you and propose that this is a new form of statement. So all of this work is done outside in nature where we actually intersect with nature so it's ecosomatic work and then we do a lot of movement to embody plasticity and malleability so that we can um, sort of dip, undifferentiate some of the cultural uh, encrustations the technical encrustations so that we can recover our body as a living, breathing process. So again, 
again, when people come, they don't come, they often have difficulty moving like this. It's almost like they need the freedom. I create the permission and the freedom for them to move. It's almost like it's a lost sense to be able to move. start with a meditation where we would uh, sort of feel our embeddedness with nature and we would feel ourselves as part of the outer world. So after they get a sequence to start, then they start moving on their own. very unfamiliar at first, but once they get the gist of actually participating in it, it becomes very natural. It becomes almost like rediscovering some newfound um, So it's done in groups. almost become containers where you can participate with evolutionary consciousness, where you can participate with um, nature. So, I wanted to leave lots of time for questions because, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to give the idea of exactly what this work is doing just through a presentation. <coughs> Does anybody have any questions? Yes? Yeah, just, I mean, it's quite beautiful. I, Thank I, I you. Um, are you aware of Emily Conrad Dowdy's work? Yes. Is she part of your inspiration? Yes. Emily Conrad was a teacher of mine. Emily Conrad passed away about a year ago. And um, I followed Emily around for years because she was the first person that I ever met that was curious about the dynamism of movement and how far that movement could take you and what was our body capable of and how what, what actually defined a body and how do we actually define a body. And what is a body for? Yeah, and so, mm -hmm. so you seem to be introducing certain sort of perinatal, prenatal forms. Yes. And those become the um, entryway. Yes. For, for more, yes. For more open ended exploration of how to do as it spontaneously arises from the Yes, you could say it's kind of like embodying our sort of formative conscious, which consciousness, which could be embryology, embryogenesis. Yeah, because yeah, when I first looked at Emily, she was kind of translucent. <laughs> but it looks like you found certain forms that you seem to you know, be more evocative or, or get, get people going to certain things or break up. Well, I think the um, most important aspect of the work is to help people to actually feel that they can exfoliate the encrustations of the modern world. The speed, the stress, the even the technical individuation gets into uh, the tissue and can harden one's posture and gestures become difficult to find, particularly creative gestures. So it's the, we start off with breath and very, very slow movement to recapture and recover our morphogenesis, which, you know, the body is a morphogenetic process. Uh, 
but because of the, the individuation that privileges technology over nature and human ways of human beings, uh, it becomes foreign. It doesn't become our reflex that we go to. It's actually quite buried underneath a lot of the defensive posturing and speed that a lot of people uh, are in a functional mode most of the time. This is kind of like a primordial anatomy. So it's like recovering your primordial anatomy uh, underneath all of the functional anatomy that has really defined us as humans pretty much since the Industrial Revolution. Yes, Leslie. Uh, that <clears throat> way back in the Iron Age, uh, during the peak of uh, humanistic psychology and uh, human potential workshops in California, uh, there was a lot of discussion of, was it Feldenkrais? Yes. Feldenkrais. Yes. Feldenkrais. Yeah. I, is there a connection? Yes. I mean, this was a guy that got people to move and... Yes. Uh, it, Remarkable is, ways, I guess. I never worked with him. There is a connection. Feldenkrais was mostly a rehabilitative movement no. um, to um, sort of recover uh, functional movement. Mm -hmm. um, but this is specifically to recover the body as a living, breathing process. It's not really about recovering functional movement. Um, what's interesting to know about this movement is that once people start doing it, they can have very cathartic uh, episodes of, of grief for, for the loss. Most of the grief is around, I lost this. It's almost like coming home, re, you know, sort of rediscovering something that you know was, was, was missing, but you didn't quite know. Like the body knows, but it doesn't quite know. Where the I would say the body knows, it's more the mental, rational that doesn't quite know. And um, a lot of people will have uh, spontaneous uh, expressions of grief around the loss of that feeling of being alive and being connected to something uh, much bigger and something that's gives them meaning. Yes? Now, I think you mentioned group dynamics in connection with this. Are people reacting to each other's movements within the group or following a leader? How does it actually work? No. I give, I give, um, you saw me in the beginning, I give sort of uh, what I call a sequence because they obviously have something, need something to work with. But those sequences are very um, sort of not, not charged with any kind of emotional material whatsoever. They're basically how the body organizes, organizes itself. So I was laying on my back and then I rolled over to my side and then I rolled over to the other side. So I give uh, sort of very non-emotional material to work with just how the body organizes itself around movement. And then, once they do that for a while, then they go into their own movement. And that's usually where the catharsis comes, is when they're in their own movement and they're recovering some sense of loss. Yes. Oh, so. okay. uh, I'm curious, like you said, you offer some particular sequence at the beginning. How do you develop those? How would you arrive at those? Uh, I'm also curious about what motivates you to identify this work as primarily feminine. Well, um, good questions. <laughs> I guess the reason I identified it as, I'll answer this one first, the reason I identified it as feminine was because my studies have been in pre- and perinatal psychology, and the work came out of uh, something that I was noticing in my clients was that they would often, without any kind of preparation at all, in movement, I was seeing motifs 
of, em of uh, embryological movement. And I became very curious about it. And I, uh, I allowed it to sort of inform both my clients and myself in the groups that I was doing. And it was movement that wanted to express itself. So most of my movement spaces are about allowing the body to move the way the body wants to move, as opposed to dictated movement from me. So it's something that started to emerge, and uh, I created the climate for it to continue to emerge, and it's still emerging. And now it's gone into sort of an interspecies kind of connectivity that people will have experiences of other species. So there seems to be something that is connected to uh, this mode of articulation that um, is buried underneath a lot of the mechanistic and functional kind of posturing and gesturing that allows this deeper wisdom to express the way it wants to express. And so I just started uh, looking into eco-philosophy because most of the uh, work that I was reading was done by feminists. And um, it wasn't until actually I found the work of Jean Gebser and then Sri Aurobindo and also Tellier de Chardin, and now recently as well, Thomas Berry, that I realized that there were a lot of uh, you know, male intellectuals talking and philosophers talking about this work, but it wasn't really presented from an let, let me point out that when I talk, uh, give my talk, I'm going to talk about uh, Skolomowski, who coined the phrase eco-philosophy back in the 80s. Okay. So. There. Yes. Uh, you might find the work of Betsy Benke very useful. She was an early Gavesarian, read uh, Gavesarian German. She was a dancer. She was a consonant violinist and improvisational performer into Feldenkrais and Alexander and all the rest. And she wrote for many years a newsletter on the phenomenology of the body very free-form uh, lady and very scholarly and serious. She worked a lot. She would do lay people down on the table and, and do body work with them and, and do free movement and dance, and that was her presentation. <laughs> yes? I'm curious, a lot of what you're talking about reminds me of some somatic body work uh, in you know, psychotherapy. Does are you familiar with like the sensory motor approach or yeah. how call me? And I'm wondering if there's an intersection here with what you're doing in that sort of modality of psych uh, somatic psychology. Yes, I have a master's in somatic psychology from Europa where I study dance movement therapy. And I'm in the PhD program here at CI, I guess, where I'm continuing this work from an eco philosophical point of view. Have you worked with Bonnie? Yes, I have. Do you see, are you familiar with Bonnie's work? Yeah. yeah. You saw, saw lots of uh, connections. Just to speak of connections, what about Marion Woodman and authentic movement? Mm -hmm. Yes, I guess you could say that, you know, it is in the lineage of this kind of, you know, phenomenological uh, movement, uh, for sure. But I, again, I, I feel like, uh, as well as that, there is a restorative capacity to this movement that I feel is more important now than ever. Um, as our future becomes increasingly dehumanized and denatured, um, the equilibrium that we're seeking lies less in material solutions and more in the intrinsic um, wisdom of our bodies and getting back into spaces where we can actually have permission and be together in community to do this kind of work to recover uh, what it is, is which is the very basis of our species wisdom and um, you know it's exciting for me because the work that's in science now 
you know, for example, the human body is mostly microorganisms. In fact, they're saying 10 to 1, 10 human, or sorry, 10 organisms to one human cell. And um, so the landscape that's starting to emerge is, is that we're really, you know, we are an organism. And um, most of the organisms that live on our body have a longer evolutionary history than we do. The, the human is the new kid on the block. And so with this kind of um, recovering of our organismic intelligence, uh, there is coupling, sensory motor coupling and signaling happening that we don't even actually uh, recognize. But in this kind of situation, and we always do it outside in nature, uh, there, that is what people are expressing, is that there is some kind of receptivity and emission happening that they cannot categorize on a mental level, but they feel it in their bodies. So the question becomes, so how do we provide for that? And this is what my work is about. How do we actually create a praxis for you know, providing the new consciousness to actually come in and join our ontology that it as Brian Swim, the body is, Brian Swim said, the body is a symbol, a primordial symbol that consciousness recognizes. It's symbolic consciousness, and that is how consciousness is attracted to modes of articulation that it recognizes and um, that it can actually enter in on. And yeah, I, I think I. One of the slides I had, for, yeah, this one, which I think really so clearly Gebser says, only a new strength of spirit kindled from a primordial divine source can create a new well, wellspring of life and the lifeless multitude will surely engender a new life, purity, freshness, and strength in physical nature. The body has a primordial endowment. It has an ever-present origin. It is our evolutionary history. And it is something that cannot be redesigned from scratch. It's an ontology, an origin, and a development. Yes? That's what Alan McInnes would say about the, the postmodernists, is they want to deconstruct things, but the body cannot be deconstructed. It cannot it be destructed. No, it is what it is. Yeah. So um, the <clears throat> subtitle of your talk was Creating the Climate for Introspectival Consciousness. Do you think it's fair to say that the way we um, work with the body is, is doing that is in part at least that it's a vehicle of uh, tapping into a reclaiming uh, archaic and magical embeddedness, magical embeddedness and an archaic sense of origin? which then is uh, a necessary foundation for a perspective, uh, uh, a, a perspective consciousness? Yes, okay. that's, a, that's a very good question. And uh, I like your question very much. Um, it is very interesting, as soon as you get people on the floor and moving like I showed you, there's a sense of wonderment that arises from that. I think it has to do with when we lie on the floor, uh, we kind of go back to the time when, let's say, you know, developmental consciousness was more dominant, maybe child youth, or, you know, and developmental movement will start to arise, like crawling on all fours, or just rolling from side to side, which you often see with babies. So yes, when we're in the vertical, position, you know, and we're so, you know, uh, oriented from our prefrontal cortex. But as soon as you lie down, then there is a sense that you go back in, uh, to a time in the consciousness of when you weren't vertical and when all your senses weren't engaged, as, as I am now speaking to you, there's a sense that I can go back to a time and I remember being on the floor, that the floor was sort of 
is where from the floor to here, I made a quantum leap in my own consciousness. So the memory of that is still in my body. So yes, there is definitely a sense of wonder and awe and a childlike quality, almost like people will say, almost like the eternal child that Jung and uh, Carl Jung referred to. This sense of a child lives inside of us always, even though we're an adult. And this kind of movement kind of evokes that, particularly in nature, for more so than anywhere else I've seen it for that reason. I don't know what reason. Question? Yes. Yeah, I, it's uh, sort of reflecting on why we uh, want to flee the body. Mm -hmm. Our history in the West has really been one of wanting to actually flee the body. Mm -hmm. uh, and what you're telling us is we need to reclaim. We need to recover. And so, from a mm -hmm. from a mythic point of view. I was reminded of those two trees in the garden, and one of them was eternal life. And this this uh, draw to create this post-human world, where it's the ultimate life of the body, where we're going to yes. actually become immortal. Yes. And we're going to actually manifest that that the, the connection with that tree that uh, we're throwing out of the garden. And we can't get to. It. So in a way, what we're trying to do is uh, complete that ultimate flight of, of the body mm -hmm. uh, with this technological creation of immortality. Uh, and the, the price, of course, we pay is a complete disconnection from the very world that we live in. Mm -hmm. It's just a, a reverie around how that myth sort of recapitulates through our, our psyches through time. This sense of a relationship to body, and yet this, this, this fear of mortality, essentially, uh, and the body's connection to our mortality, and our ways to uh, overcome that. May I answer that? Yeah. I actually think it's a great question. I actually think what you're referring to is something I've thought about a lot, is that our fascination with technology is that it gives us this individuation that is kind of plastic and mm -hmm. unending. And we've become so trapped in our bodies that we've lost our own plasticity and malleability. So we look for it in exosomatic organs, which is what I started out with, you know, showing that our, our bodies have become colonized by technology. So the sense of fr uh, freedom and possibility in our own body is not there, it's lost. So we keep looking for it, for it in outside ourselves in forms of magic and also in... Uh, well, the cloud is, an, is a manifestation of that. We, the, the cloud. We put things in the mm -hmm. cloud that we no longer yes. need to remember <laughs> right. or hold the yeah. <laughs> So we're always looking for ways to extend ourselves beyond right. our own but it's, it starts right here. This is where the plasticity and the malleability and the morphogenesis needs to happen, to find the freedom outside. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.